Well, hey, everybody. Uh, my conversation with uh, Brad Lyons about the book that he and uh, Bruce Barkhauer. Barkhauer. What a yep. great name, Bruce Barkhauer. I mean, nothing wrong with Brad Lyons and Doug Badgett, but Bruce Barkhauer. It's a great name. The book is uh, America's Holy Ground. And, and the subtitle is where it gets interesting, it seems to me. Uh, 60 Faithful Reflections on Our National Parks. Brad, I've never heard of a book like this. Um, are, are these common to have uh, books that exist that, that tell a, uh, reflections on, I don't know, uh, spaces and places, or is this a new concept? I, I've not found anything like it, uh, which is one of the things that made this a lot of fun to write, is that I didn't have to worry about um, you know, create, creating something that was different from something else. Yeah. Uh, this was a lot of fun. You, know, you talked about the subtitle, and what's funny is actually – you have an early copy of the book. The book that's for sale oh. is 61 copies. <laughs> 61, 61 National Parks reflections. because uh, in late February, we had those uh, copies printed up uh, for advanced um, media marketing, that kind of stuff. And as part of the government shutdown, they created a new national park, Indiana Dunes, uh, in along the shores of Lake Michigan. So what? Okay, this, hang, hang on a second. As a part yeah. of the government shutdown, they created a new national park? No one ever said the federal government makes sense. But yes, yes. So the, we, we, we had sent the book to the printer on Thursday. On Friday, they created this new national park. No. <laughs> so we had about a week or so where we were thinking, okay, do we hold the 60? Do we add 61? What all would this take? And so, you know, a week later, we're updating the cover, we're changing the internal layout, and we're adding the 61st National Park. Um, that, so, that all of a sudden, that one feels like the most interesting uh, one in the entire list of Indiana uh, Dunes National Park. In, um, Indiana Dunes. Okay. One so, that Bruce so, and I co wrote. Oh, because the others, each of you, you, you took mm-hmm. turns. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Right. We divvied them up 30 for each. All right. So does this mean that there are and, and tr- you know, treat me gently here like I don't know anything because I don't. Does this mean there are 61 national parks? That's correct. OK, see, I didn't know this. I didn't know this either. Um, there's 61 national parks. What, what, what constitutes a national park? Um, and why do I know of like five and then someone would name two more and I'd be like, oh, yeah, of course. But, uh, you know, yeah. I think of like uh, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Zion, mm-hmm. um, uh, I don't know, Niagara Falls. Uh, no. OK, see, oh. three and then a couple that I make up. Uh, OK, so I, that might be true of other people, too. They don't actually know about uh, all the national parks. It is confusing. Um, so the National Park Service, you know, and so you picture a ranger with the unique brown hat and the flat rim and the kind of gray and olive uniform. And a talking they, a talking bear that goes around with him and helps him uh, get into all yes, kinds of antics. Yes. Um, so the National Park Service manages more than 400 sites across the country uh, and in U.S. territories. Um, so a lot of those were created by the Antiquities Act that was passed um, by Teddy Roosevelt in Congress, which, which gave the president the power to unilaterally declare a particular property, a national monument or a national uh, lake shore or some kind of nationally treasured resource. National parks are a little different because they have to be approved by Congress. And so 61 times in American history, Congress has approved legislation that creates a national park. That's the legal definition. When you look at the National Park Service's um, language around this, what they're trying to say is that national parks offer a lot of different experiences, uh, natural or activities or based on what the society offers. And so what our society treasures and values. And so, yeah, the first one was Yellowstone. Um, and so it, it moves up through those, some of those that you named Sequoia, Grand Canyon, you know, a lot of those have been around a long time. A lot of them, um, were added on one day in 1980 when Jimmy Carter signed a bill that created seven new national parks and they are all in Alaska. Um, doesn't include Denali, but it includes a lot of the other smaller parks. So we've been adding these on and a lot of them, a lot of them were pre world war II, And then we kind of took a little break and then, uh, once the conservation movement fired up again in the seventies, there was a new surge of these. Um, so, you know, the most recently created one I mentioned a moment ago was Indiana dunes just this past February. 
And is, is, that, is an area yeah, like this something before it becomes a national park? Like, is it a restricted area or is it run by this? Like, is there is there some process by that, that an area goes through before it becomes a national park? Like it, it earns its um, stripes. Not that I've been as, able to discern. Hmm. <laughs> huh. um, I, I will admit this is not my forte, but there, I, it, it appears that they have all been federally owned before they reach that. And so oh. they work their way up like national monuments. And so okay. um, there are, there are lots of places that folks think about that they expect to be national parks, but aren't. So Mount Rushmore, not a national park. It's a national monument. Devil's Tower, same story. Um, they are not national parks, but they are national park service units. Interesting. <laughs> um, so what we did, when Bruce and I were, were talking about this idea, we realized there was no way we could write 400 and something unique reflections initially. Right. We're working. Yeah. Um, but we realized that we had this group of 60 uh, that kind of are the, the top level, the cream of the crop that we could focus on that were national parks that were clearly designated in a different kind of way. Hmm. Um, and so that's where we focused our energies was to, to, to work on those national parks. All right. So you mentioned, you know, this isn't really your forte, but you've just said more about national parks than I've ever, uh, I've ever heard in my life. And you've literally written a book about them. So with that level of, of forte, um, why did you and Brad even start talking about this? Like what, what's your own yeah. um, interest in, in national parks? Are you someone that as a kid, your family threw in the back of a station wagon and said, we're going to go on vacation. And that meant camping out in a, in a park somewhere. Yeah. It was a 1976 oh. uh, burnt orange Monte Carlo. Is this true? Okay. Uh, I was, I was just true. making that up. as like, like 77, something like that. Yeah. Right. But it was definitely burnt orange. Uh, it was the seventies. Please forgive us. Um, as a kid, I, we did do these epic road trips, huh. um, and I remember we, my, my, my aunt lived in California, and so when you grow up in Oklahoma and you drive to California, it's darn near National Lampoon's vacation all over again. Um, <laughs> nice. But I remember as a kid seeing the Grand Canyon, and, and it didn't make as much of an impact on me as it should have at the time. I was too young to appreciate it. What did make an impact on me, though, was on the way back when we went to Carlsbad Caverns. Um, I remember going down that elevator and walking off into the main room and I don't know that I'd ever been in a cave before. And so if you've yeah. been to Carlsbad, the, 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 the God created sculptures down there and the darkness and the fact that animals live down there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the bats all over the place nesting cause it was during the day, but you know, come sunset, they're going to go out and eat, um, the colors, the smell, mm. the um, the concept that I'm hundreds of feet below ground, uh, that made a huge impact on me. Um, and so I, I, this was before I had my camera, so I'm guessing it was second or third grade. Because mm. um, I don't have pictures there, either that or my dad said, you're never going to get anything to turn out in here. But right. anyhow. Um, Your little flash bulb on the top. Yeah, my little, used yeah up exactly. Four, the the bar four. that you had to turn upside down after four pictures. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then throw away. God, yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you for that throwback yeah, memory. Yeah, there. yeah, we learned how to waste as children. So, oh, you know, yeah. let's just say it's, um, it's been a childhood but, practice. But that made such an impact on me. I remember I, I bought two rocks at the gift mm. shop on the way out, uh -huh. and I still have those two rocks and a lot of others. Uh, it started, uh, I mean, I'm not a geologist, but it does give me um, a, a tangible reminder of yeah. that experience. And so I've, I've looked at that rock a couple of times and gone, you didn't, I had no idea what kind of trouble I was getting into when I bought you. So, um, you know, we had these adventures and we went to Yellowstone and we went to the Grand Canyon and Zion and Bryce Canyon um, and several of these other parks. And, and so I've always had an appreciation for national parks, but uh, where this book was born was actually on Bruce's back porch uh, in suburban Louisville a couple of years ago. Mm. I had stopped over because I was on my way home from the Wild Goose Festival mm -hmm. uh, in Western North Carolina, driving back to St. Louis. And that was just too long of a drive. So we're sitting on the back porch and we, I don't even remember how we got started on it, but we both realized that we both had a love of the national parks. We both had a love of photography. And I said, you know, I've been kicking around this idea of doing a devotional book about national parks. And I believe Bruce's comment was essentially, tell me more about that. Huh. <laughs> and so we kicked it around a few years. And um, last year we finally said, you know, this is really a pretty good idea. Let's, let's see what we can yeah, do with this. Yeah. And so, you know, it seems to me, I have some friends that have just started uh, hitting up national parks. Uh, I'm, I'm in Minneapolis, so they've been driving and flying, you know, to yeah. uh, to Wyoming and, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Arizona. And my friend Skip was just saying the other day, I said, oh, you, you went back to the national park. And he said, no, we were actually at a different one. And then he started to describe each park with its own almost like personality or essence. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you do a bit of that in the book with each park you, you name, you know, uh, the exactly. state that it's in, uh, uh, the, uh, a date, which I want to ask you about. And then you, you put a, a, a descriptor with it, like consequences or Mm -hmm. diversity or adaptation. He was Mm -hmm. sort of doing the same thing. And he said, wow, for the experience of our children, they have four kids under 10. He said they, they experience each park really differently. Some of them feel like a playground. Some of them are in awe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is that the kind of thing that, that you knew all along about these parks or did you discover their different personalities more when you got into the project? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I I think back to the parks I've been to, and they've always felt a little bit different. But I think that's because um, I was a different age when I oh, hit a lot of them, and nice. so I perceived things differently. I remember, you know, Zion was was tenth grade, and it's always going to be associated with uh, Bruce Springsteen because that's what I was listening to that summer. Um, born in the USA. That is a, that um, is a fantastic combination in my mind. It is. That's, yeah, um, I will remember Yellowstone. Um, and being in middle school, um, and also again, also when I was in my forties, uh, a couple of times, I've been back there twice in the last few years. Um, so every, every time I go to a park, um, it's a little bit different. Hmm. And I think it, it does, it, it's the perception that you're viewing the world through at that particular time. Wow. But I do think all the parks have their own unique, uh, feels to them. At least a lot of them do. Um, I was trying to figure this up this morning. My guess is that I've been to about two dozen of the national parks. Um, and I did almost half of those last summer uh, in, in prep for this book. Because of the book. So That's so right. the other ones that you haven't been to, how did you, where, where, where did the photo, I, I should mention that the book is um, more than half photos. Like it, it, it's, it's a bit of a photo book. Uh, mm-hmm. A little later, I'll ask you as not only the author, but uh, the, the the publisher, like how you make that decision. But um, it, it feels uh, like a photo book that you're looking at and seeing some of the more iconic, uh, mm-hmm. some of the more iconic moments. Who took the photos that are in the, the that are in the book? Yeah, by and large, those are all almost all about 80 percent National Park Service photos. Oh. Um, so there is a spectacular website. Um that archives hundreds of thousands of photos, videos, illustrations, um, all kinds of stuff. And, and, um, really? Yeah. And so there's, uh, there's the, the photo credits in the back were actually, that was the hardest part of the book was getting all of those little photo credits. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, um, I can see those. And, and so the, the national park service photographers are, public employees and so their work is public domain so not to turn this into a lecture on copyright but what that means is you can use it and so um we went through each of these national parks and you know some of these parks have you know a hundred images to look at and some of these parks have thousands of images to look at and so um that's a great way to spend the right. winter is photo right. editing so, this book. <laughs> so, as, so as I was going to say, so as uh, as an author and for you as an as an author and an editor and a publisher, there's the word side of books, which is mm-hmm. complicated and hard. And how do you decide? And what do you cut out? And mm-hmm. how do you pick your frame? How do you begin to do that when you're looking at sixty parks and hundreds or thousands of photos from each one? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what what went into that, the process, and did you find yourself now having to be a photojournalist and developing skills that you didn't uh, ever think you would have to have? Yeah, uh, I, I, I picked some of those up in, in my journalism education um, 25 years ago at the University of Missouri. So I've, I've always had a little bit of that. I see. Bruce is a photographer as well. Uh, and so we both had those skills kind of you know, innate and working in the back of our heads. That said, when you're looking through these photos, it really is what are the most beautiful photos that match the theme in the park? Um, and so when we were looking at the National Park Service photos, we were looking uh, realistically, one, is this a high-res photo? I mean, that's the printer in me, uh, making sure that the picture is going to look good on the page. Um, and, and two, um, is it public domain? Because not all of them are. And three, is this a pretty picture? Uh, to put it, you know, blunt. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And so I, I, best flight I ever had, I was flying home from Denver at Thanksgiving and I was photo editing at 35,000 feet 
picking out the best, the, the final round of photos for this yeah. book. That was a nice, nice flight home. Yeah, that's um, a good day. So, yeah, I, if you go to the National Park Service's um, gallery, and I can send a link later or post it on social media, sure, it's a great way to spend a snowy afternoon. I know we're not going to have any snowy afternoons for another several months. Well, maybe in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the snow is just melting today. So, yeah, don't please, uh, please but, don't even say snowy afternoon. It's uh, it's raining outside, and it's still a little. All right. You know, My we're not we're not quite confident that the snow that the snow is uh, not going to visit us again around here. Terrible. From your from your lips to God's ears. Yeah, please. Um, but pulling all those photos, that was a that was a ton of fun. Most of the writing on this was done by October. And so then we hunkered down on the on the photos and captions that we had to pull together next. And, um, you know, we were we were subbing out photos even in January as we were getting to the final point. But it, and it feels like the kind of book that would be interesting for someone who was going to uh, go to some national parks this summer or are thinking mm-hmm. about that. Or, you know, they start into the we should travel a little more. But what do we do with kids sort of thing? Yeah. And because there's certain national parks, again, these friends of mine that just recently started finding these other parks, um, they were saying as, you know, fairly well informed people. Uh, mm-hmm. why did I have no idea that all these parks existed? Like just yeah. no idea. I knew, you know, they said, we know about, of course, the grand Canyon and Yosemite, yeah. um, and you know, m- maybe another one or two, but yeah. th- they just had no idea. And so as they got into this world, it, it started to open up to them about where you could sure. go. You could uh, nearly every state D- does every state have a national park. Every state has a national park service unit, but not every state has a national park. Do you happen to know uh, what states don't have a national park? Does Minnesota uh, a lot have of them? Do- a lot of them. Um, really? If I had if I had sixty seconds in a map of the U.S., I could probably <laughs> read off the top of my head fifty eight of them. I always seem to forget Joshua Tree, oh. uh, even though it's a beautiful park and I've been there a, a couple times, and it's just it's wonderful. I somehow managed to forget that. But there, but a lot of them are concentrated basically west of the Rockies. Hmm. Um, and so in the early, the early days of the park service, they acknowledged that. And so that's one of the reasons they created, um, Shenandoah and Great Smoky Mountain, um, and Acadia and those, those three in particular fed the Eastern population, but a lot of them were out West, but, um, you know, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, that they have no national parks, uh, Louisiana, a lot of the South doesn't, but yeah. And there are beautiful things to see there, obviously, but there are not something that the federal government takes over as a national park, I guess. Um, not I, yet. And but, I think there, there will be more. Uh, there are lots of beautiful sites out there that it's just going to require the right legislation at the right time. You know, there's constant rumblings that say White Sands National Monument in New Mexico is going to get uh, national mm. park status. I'm, I'm waiting for that to, to create uh, 62 faithful reflections. <laughs> so the updated version. Hey, um, uh, I, I, can't help but be political about some of these things. And it seems that the Trump administration, along with the rest of the complicit Republican Congress, wants to open up many of or some of our national parks Mm -hmm. and to pull back some of the protections that have been given to national parks Mm -hmm. and to, you you know, to to drill in them or to build things or to, you know, uh, put up a, I don't know, a a Trump gift shop or whatever it is that their ideas are. Um, Is that is that something that people should really be uh, worried about is there is there a move of the current political system to um uh, allow parks to be less pristine than they have been before that has been a tension in the national park system since day one oh um so i can't blame that solely on donald trump's no, election to the presidency no. and and so if if you're if you're following this and you have 12 hours to spare this weekend i mm-hmm. strongly encourage you to binge watch the ken burns national parks video um, mm. which I wish I had done before I wrote this book. I, I just watched it a <laughs> sure. couple of weeks ago and, and, yeah. I, and if I could do time travel, I would, but that's been a constant struggle, uh, trying to figure out how do you balance the nature that's there? Um, even in its early days, the, the native American populations that, that mm-hmm. hunted and, and passed through Yellowstone. There are early stories of, 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 of native American battles in the boundaries of wow. Yellowstone national park. Um, uh, you know, there how do you balance the wildlife, the indigenous population, the needs of growing cities? So the environmental movement was was a lot of folks look back at the creation of creation of the Hetch Hetchy Dam in Yosemite National Park, a water reservoir for the city of San Francisco. 
that's where they look back at as the roots. And you know, it's a major loss that there's this beautiful canyon in Yosemite that it's now under hundreds of feet of water as a water reservoir for the city of San Francisco. Oh, mm-hmm. So, you know, it begins there. Um, and it's, it's been a constant tension, uh, developing the, the mission 66 plan that mm. developed, uh, roads and hotels and infrastructure in those national parks that we all take for granted, haven't always been there. And, and it's controversial even today. How many people do you let into Yosemite right. on a really nice summer day? Um, so those tensions are, are, have existed for a long time and it's not just, um, the, the the element of privatizing national parks is is the latest thing to come this way um, and I think the, the the good thing about national parks is that they have these strong avid backers who this is their hill that they're going to die on uh-huh. and they will defend those those lands like like quite literally the hill that they will yeah have. yeah all right, all right. so uh, it's it's yeah. called america's holy ground so you're uh, making a plan that and then it's 60 faithful reflections so the the content the the, the words in, in the book mm-hmm. um try to help people have a um a faithful reflection talk, talk about how you use that word and what that means and what faithful reflections are so each of these um entries begins with scripture Mm-hmm. Um, so we realized from er, from the early stages that if we're going to have a reflection, we want to be able to tie it somehow to the common document that all of our all of our Christian siblings share. And so we went through and we pulled scriptures that matched the themes. And so um, at least the way I did it, and I, I, I'm not sure if this is the same for Bruce or not, but the way I would do it is I would do my research, figure out what theme I wanted. And so that's the word that's at the top of each of these these. I see. Um, these entries. That's the theme that I selected. And then I would find a scripture that worked. Uh, and we'd plug that in at the top. And then from there, that's where I'd start writing. Um, so what we want to do is find the holy aspects of each park. So <clears throat> when I was, when I was identifying the theme, I would, I would write up a, you know, kind of a, you know, a description of the park and some of its certain characteristics. And I would find myself writing towards the goal of asking the three questions that are at the end of every one of these. Every, every entry has three questions that will help you reflect on your own experiences on a particular um, Christian value or principle, um, how, you, how, how, it, how it reflects on your life, and how you model that for others. Um, because we acknowledge that we live in community and in a lot of ways, a lot of times we're asking, how do you model this for other people? Mm-hmm. Is there someone who could use um, your your strengths in this particular area at this time to to have a better life and a stronger faith life. So that was that was the the general approach that we took to each of these. I hope we hit the mark. Well, I, okay. So I'll, I'll give an example in the Denali National Park, which is in Alaska. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. You uh, say uh, 1917. What right. what what what's significant about 1917? In the that is the... when um, Congress made denali a national park okay so so that's the year of its Correct. national parkness and then <laughs> and then uh and and name is the is the theme for right. for, for, for this one right so um did, did you write that particular one is this is this I one did, of yours i did not oh. um bruce wrote that one but okay. what i know about it is that when when that national park was originally created it was mount mckinley Oh, I thought uh, that so, was in Washington State, Mount McKinley. No, Mount McKinley is, was when you know, when I was a kid was the was the tallest mountain in yeah. North America. Mm-hmm. Um, but that hasn't been its name for very long. It has been known as Denali. The the, uh, what is the what's the actual translation? Bruce got it in here. Uh, the high one. There we go. Um, so there was there was a lot of tension for many years over calling it Mount McKinley because the indigenous population knows right. it as Denali. So I mentioned earlier when the, those seven national parks were created, I believe that's also when Mount McKinley became Denali. So it's one of the few parks that's changed its name. Okay. So that's interesting, but you're saying in 1917, when they established mm-hmm. it as a park, the mm-hmm. official name changed to Denali, but it had been cal- called Mount McKinley, which I'm guessing well, was named after a center or something. And all the way up into your childhood, mm-hmm. uh, the indigenous name was not the one that was uh, sort of passed along, even though there was some official name change, people still referred to it by the, um, by the the anglicized 
uh, yeah. naming of it. Yeah, named from William McKinley, the president, who was assassinated not long oh, before, right. well, during Alaska's territorial times, yeah. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's right. Um, so so yeah. Bruce identified that this was a, a unique aspect of, of Denali National Park. And so... You know, we, we all, we, we, there are the biblical stories about names and name changes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Bruce chose to focus in on is, is we, we know the names by which we are called. Uh, So that's, that's the, that's the jump. That's how we get. And so his three questions at the end, he he recognizes that all across the United States, we've sort of blended in indigenous native names and words. Uh, I live in Minnesota, which is, you know, the, the, the indigenous word for blue sky or sky blue waters, that kind of thing. And then I he asked the these land three, of the big canoe. Uh, you do <laughs> yeah, the land of the big canoe. Is that what I it means? That's right. Yeah. That's, I love it. Um, so bring that big canoe up to the sky blue waters up here. I would love to. Um, uh, and, and he says, so, so he notes that. And then he asks these three questions and this, this one really, I thought was great. Uh, yeah. who are the people who lived on and named the land before you were there? Like that's mm-hmm. just a that's a really great question that I know has been timely for the last thirty or forty years. When I was a child, we were we were mm-hmm. asked to think about that. You know, who were the people that were here uh, before us? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I don't think we've gone far enough to sort of uh, decide what we're going to do about that. But but it's well, just it's great to even recognize that there were other people who called this by different names. Um, right. What does it mean to give your name to someone or some cause? And how do you want your name? to be remembered. So when you mm-hmm. say there's these like, like reflection questions at the end, they're, they're simple like that. I, and, and I bring right. that up just so people don't think it's like, um, one of those fill in the blank sermon sheets, uh, oh, yeah. in the, uh, you know, <laughs> where it's like, Not there's a, there, there's yeah. a right answer and a wrong answer. And, uh, that's what you're, uh, that's what you're looking for on, on the questions. It, it, it asks you to take this parks contribution and then to, and then to, uh, reflect on it in some way. All right. So exactly. you pick some, you, you picked a theme that found a uh, Christian biblical passage that could go with it. And mm-hmm. then you have these questions and, um, what if someone's not really into parks, but they're kind of into, you know, a devotional reflections and they, they like mm-hmm. to read something that are, you know, a few hundred words long. You know, most of these are one page or two pages long. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, they're sort of designed for, I don't know, an evening read or something you might want to grab in the morning to sort of right. turn your thought. Is it do, do you do you hope it is? And have you found with anyone who's looked at it? Is it helpful for people who don't yet um, uh, are, aren't really into the parks? but they are using it as a devotional piece in and of itself. I, I think that there's a way to use it that way. Yeah. I, it's still early on and I have, I haven't collected that specific story yet, but I have a feeling I will eventually. Yeah. Um, wh- one of the things that we were very clear about is that this book needed to work wherever you were, hmm. um, that it needs to be accessible whether you're in a national park or your own neighborhood park. I live across the street from a playground right here. And so this morning <laughs> there were kids running around screaming and I enjoyed, you know, knowing that they were getting some of their energy out before school. But we wrote this book so that you could um, use it, whether you were in a national park or just dreaming about having been there um, or going there or, um, or to find those kinds of int- those reflections on your own. I, I yeah. think you do, it, it would help to be a nature lover and to appreciate what these individual parks bring, but I don't think that that's required to enjoy America's holy ground. So many of them, I'm looking, I flipped to the page on Bryce Canyon in, in mm-hmm. Utah, and the, the, the photo is just stunning, right? And That's Bruce's. Uh, and when he took that photo. He took that photo. Wow. It, I know. <laughs> it, it's really stunning. The experience a lot of us have in when we go to the the big parks is mm-hmm. that they they really overwhelm right i mean they mm-hmm. are they are cathedral in that largest sense like you really feel like there's a um a beauty that is encompassing and you really find yourself inside of it yeah. other parks are a little different than that though like you you start off by describing the ones that you went down into the mm-hmm. into the caves where it was small and and enclosed like what what have you noticed about now and and now now just beyond the parks themselves but just about what exists in this country and around the world of the physical spaces and what that sort of does to the human Hmm. life and experience and all yeah so you you and i are talking two days after notre dame burned Hmm. um and so all I, I my my sense Monday was I I feel like I'm the only person on the planet who hasn't been to Notre Dame, <laughs> uh, at least if you go by my yeah. social media. Yeah. And I think 
the the grieving and lamentations that we heard reflect the holy space that affects all of us. Mm. Um, even having not been there, I feel that that loss. Yeah, um, right, right. And and so I, as as we look at the holy spaces, I think it, it, again, depending on who you are, they're different things. Mm. For for some people, it's mm. national parks. For some people, it's baseball parks. Um, I, you know, nice. in St. Louis, there are a lot of people who go to worship at the cathedral of Bush stadium. Oh yeah. I've, I've met people on airplanes. I'm like, hey, so where are you going? They say, well, I'm touring. I'm trying to get every base going to every baseball park, uh, in right. the country. And I've got five on this trip or something. I, yeah. I ne- never crossed my mind that people would tour, not teams and not mm-hmm. even baseball, but the park itself. Yeah. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. So you know, we all have our own sacred spaces. And for, you know, for some of us, those are the homes that we, we feel comfortable in where our families live. Those are our hometowns mm-hmm. and the old haunts for some of us. It's, you know, when we go back mm-hmm. to the campus where we had great, you know, undergraduate uh, experiences uh, there, there are lots and lots and lots of holy spaces all mm-hmm. around us and they're constantly in flux. Um, you know, my hometown looks very different than it did when I lived there 20 years ago. And it looked very different than it did the 15 years before that. Um so we adjust those. We find new ones. We go back to old ones and we say, this isn't as holy as it used to be. Um, yeah, but that's, right. again, that's the context of where, uh, where we are in our own particular lives. Um, if you are able to find a holy place that sticks with you your whole life, hmm. that's, that's a treasure. That's wow. really something. Mm-hmm. Um, if, I, if I have to guess what that place is, there's a couple of them. Uh, Yellowstone would be my book oriented one. I, that's my favorite. I, Yellowstone is my place. Um, but you know, I'm also, I, I dream about the wheat fields of Oklahoma where I grew up. Uh-huh. Um, and so I know that that's a holy place for me. So I think about that. I think about the churches that I've been parts of over the years. Um, and some of those other you know, special moments, those God mm-hmm. moments that we're trying to, uh, trying to inspire in America's holy ground because we've all had those strange moments. Um, and a lot of them are hospital rooms. Wow. You know, you think about that. Um, holy ground is a hospital room where something sacred happens, where a life is saved or a life ends. Um, that's a sacred place for us. You know, anybody who drives America's highways, you're going to see yeah. the little roadside memorials. Those are sacred spaces mm-hmm. to some family that you'll never know. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful way to think are. about it, that to have sort of eyes to see the, the, the sacred spaces and the places mm-hmm. that people have determined and called holy. Um, so is the book out now? I, I know it's, I know it's April, April release, but you know, I have this old, this old version from when it was only 60 reflections. Uh, yeah, is the, is yeah. the well, 61 you collectors item. And I look, I expect you to sell it on eBay <laughs> soon. Um, the book is available. You can order it anywhere you buy your books, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. We would love it if you'd come to chalicepress.com and purchase it from us, the publisher. Um, there are, there are lots of places where we are working our way into bookstores right now. Uh, so we're hoping that, that you'll be able to pick one up there, but right now your best, if you want to get it today, order it online, order it online. And I'll tell you, um, this one's worth getting in a, in a hard copy. Um, as a, I mean, Kindle books are fine. The audio book I think shouldn't exist because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's because it's as much a photo, um, uh, experience as it mm-hmm. is a, um, a reading experience. It, it, it really yeah. has that. It, it really does have that sense. So if you're thinking about traveling this summer or you've, uh, you've been into parks and you, you know that there's some other ones that you want to find out about, uh, this is a great way. Or if you're just looking for something that's going to reflect on the, the relationship to, to nature and to place, that's one of the things I, I like about your title. Uh, again, it's America's Holy Ground. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it, um, it's, it's naming the holiness, sort of the, 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 the sanctifying nature of nature um, that's public. Like, I really like the idea that it's um, it's not a, a segregated holy place. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so much of the conversation that's gone on about the tragic burning of, of, of Notre Dame is that people were saying, you know, sure it was, it's Catholic and it was built, you know, by the Catholics and it was a part of a Catholic narrative from 800 years ago, but it's really transcended and become something that everyone's a part of. Well, sure. that's most certainly true of uh, places on the planet and that these places are 
segregated off as national parks in order for people to approach them. It, like they're, they've been made distinct so that they are more participatory. So exactly. often we make things distinct so that only certain people can access them, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. boundaries uh, of prevention as opposed to boundaries of invitation. And, and yeah. the, the American uh, national parks and so much that we've uh, chosen to do are, are, are like that. Um, let me just ask you, I know we only have a couple minutes left, uh, but you are also a publisher, and uh, this is published by Chalice Press, uh, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the great presses uh, in America. Thank um, you. And um, how what what's what's it like being an author? Or have, have you been an author before in your own in your own press? And uh, and if so, what's no. what's that? Okay, what's that been like this time uh, to be an well, author and and the publisher? Um, so we actually had to create a um, conflict of interest policy th so that I wasn't approving my own book. <laughs> and that involved uh, a couple of staff members and a member of my board of directors. So, so, there, so it's I not self-published in that that's sense. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it is, this was my plot all along was to take over this place and push yeah. it out this book. Uh, no, we, we had a lot of safeguards um, in place to make sure that I wasn't using my position un sure. um, unduly. So uh, it has been an interesting process because, you know, I, I've worked from the publisher side so much, but um I tried my best to, to push on work on this to the evenings or the weekends. So that mm. wasn't interfering with what I was doing, but you know, there are going to be questions. You know, my designer walks over next door and says, got a question about the book. And I'm like, okay, I'm off the clock. <laughs> that kind of <laughs> stuff. But, um, well, well, I, do, I, then I, do I you, let my staff answer that question, whether or not I was annoying. I hope not. Do, do you like every other author I know then uh, just complain about the marketing of the book and that the publisher doesn't do enough to support your book? Or is that, do you get to set that aside? Like every author I, I know the, that's I'm like the only author who is not allowed to do that. <laughs> they would do that. I think our marketing on this is spectacular. And I well, love our stuff. Well, Chalice Press has the best marketing going, but I'll tell you, uh, every author I know feels that way. Um, it's, uh, it, it is just a, it's just part and parcel with uh, people writing books i have been in cars with very famous authors whose books are selling like crazy and they're like i'm like hey congratulations on how well your book is doing. you know just totally off the right like they're not talking yeah. to anybody and they'll be like yeah boy yeah. if i could get the marketing to if they would just like it's this it's this very i i've published a number of books and i feel that way and everybody does and you just sort of realize um, you love a book as an author or feel a commitment to it or have factored it into your life in some way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's impossible for anyone to come around it. Um, uh, and, and I guess there's probably one or two people that are like, wow, this really did better than I thought. And I had no idea people would be uh, so, as excited about my book as I am. Um, yeah. So I imagine that being on both sides of it is, um, you know, it's uh, that that adds extra pressure to you and to and, and well, I guess Bruce doesn't work for the, for the publisher. So yeah. he no, just it, gets to be an author. It, here's what it does do. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. Actually. Uh, I, I have said several times, I don't feel like I was working, putting this book together. Yeah. It was so much fun to write this and photo edit it. It was, it was like a really awesome hobby. You're right. I mean, it, it about, about the, the publishing audio industry. It is a tough place right oh. now. And, you know, with, with Amazon doing its thing, and with Christian bookstores shutting down, we had what Family Life Center a few years ago, and now Lifeway is announcing that they're shutting down their brick and mortar stores. Um, you know, books book sales are are more and more online every day. Um, so these independent bookstores that are popping up, God bless them. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to support those however we can. So you know, you can you can also get a copy of America's Holy Ground from your local independent bookstore okay. if that's if that's a, a, a cause you want to support. Um, but it is tough and, and you're right. Yeah. We're all proud of our work. When we write a book, we have, we have spent a lot of time right. and energy and passion pouring it into this product. And we want to see people, uh, proud of it. Uh, we want to see people enjoying it and using it. And so we're proud of it and we yeah. want to, we want to see, great. see it succeed. So it's, it's, yeah, there's always more to be done. Yeah. And, um, and just to be clear, not, not, not everyone is, a. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders millionaire where you say, Hey, I, you know, the reason I became a millionaire is I wrote a book. Yeah. Uh, people oh, think that true. though, they really do. I mean, they, they, and it gets sort of reinforced by the onesies and twosies that pop up yeah. in society where a book just sells so many copies that a person becomes, you know, independently wealthy and, and, you know, has to, has to explain their millionaire status. That's yeah. not the normal experience for book authors, right? Oh. Like if somebody's going to write a book or a publisher, publishers, um, 
and I'll just brag about you all and, and others for a moment here. Um, like, like your, your commitment is not simply we're going to extract hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars out of, out of the economy by publishing this book. There, there are that, commitments that, that go well incredible. beyond. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well beyond that. It is, um, uh, it's, it's not just, um, uh, a cash cow that boy, all you have to do is get a book contract and now you're going to become independently wealthy. It's, uh, it's like, like so many things that are, that are important and meaningful and make our lives, uh, it, uh, seem like they have value in this world. They're, they're acts of charity and they're acts of love and they're acts of graciousness and, and goodness mm-hmm. to one another. And books are very much that way. So, um, yeah. so yeah. I think when somebody writes a book, you know, it, it might not make your career, but hopefully it makes a contribution to the, to the yeah. mosaic of goodness. Right. Well, Chalice Press is a is a five hundred one c three nonprofit, um, <laughs> and we, you li- and you live up to the nonprofit status, right? That kind of thing. Well, that that we, old joke. We, we try not to, yeah. yeah. Um, but but we're what that does is that that sets us apart from so many other publishers in that you know we we're a ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, Chalice Press is um, the imprint of the Christian Board of Publication, which has existed since nineteen eleven as the publishing house of what is now known as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ one of the mainline denominations, a small one, but, but present. Um, and so we, we look at our mission in the world to spread a, the, the news of God's open table, mm. that all are welcome to join in what God calls us to do. Mm. And so that's, that's one of the things that we look at in every child's press book is how does this further that? How does this welcome additional people to, the experience that God and Jesus shared with mm, us. Nice. And so, you know, that's what the America's Holy Ground does is it shares that experience in a new different way. Yeah. Um, we exclude no one. We include everybody. And we are mm. very clear about that. Um, uh, we, we run the spectrum. We are, we are LGBTQ affirming. We want to bring in liberal and conservative voices and have a civil dialogue, which used to happen. <laughs> um, so we're, we're constantly working towards that. So that's one of the things that mm-hmm. makes us a little bit different than the big five mm-hmm. that are, um, that, that are publishing those big books that will change an author's life. Yeah. There are a few that are, that run around in our circles, but we, we do it for the love of yeah, the sure, 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 and the love of, of the church. Yeah. Well, when you're a millionaire uh, after this, uh, just remember the rest of us. Brad, thanks so much for being part of this. Uh, great to talk with you. Congratulations on the book, America's Holy Ground 61, Faithful Reflections go. on Our National Parks. Um, and, and I'm still buzzing about the fact that during the government shutdown, there was uh, the creation of a national it's park. It's strange. Yeah. <laughs> I would say real quick, if, if you want to learn more, we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash America's Holy Ground. Uh, you can also go to americasholyground.com to learn more about the book, to take a sample look inside uh, in the next week or so. Next week is National Parks Week, by the way. So if you um, if you are looking for something to do this weekend, I believe, uh, you know what, I'm not going to say what day it is because I'll get it wrong, but check National Parks or NPS.gov and, because there's free admission at every national park. Fantastic. Sometime this weekend. So make sure you get out there if you get a chance. Uh, but we're going to be we're going to be providing some new content. Uh, on some of the other other national parks, and uh, so go to americasholyground dot com to sign up for that list. It's uh, it's yeah. ever evolving. Well, congratulations, yeah. Brad, and thanks. Thanks, Doug.